growing a little larger, it seems like, every week, and uh, that seems to be the case with our Sunday morning assemblies as well. It seems like every week we have a couple more people come back to us, and uh, uh, we're thankful for uh, your presence. If you're online with us today, thank you for coming our way. We hope that uh, our study will be beneficial to you. Uh, we are continuing our study today in basic concepts of Scripture, uh, uh, a study that has been based on some work by Brother Gene Taylor on padfield.com. And today we're going to be talking about the subject of sanctification. Sanctification, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a few moments. Uh, by way of announcement, remember all of the things that are uh, taking place in our church family. Continue to remember the Tennyson family and passing of Sister Edith this past week. Uh, also remember those who continue to be on our prayer list uh, number of individuals. We do have some good news to report today. Betty Odom, this is Charles's mother, uh, has been in ICU over the last week and a half and uh, on event for a good bit of that time due to COVID pneumonia and we're thankful that uh, she is no longer on event and she is out of ICU. That doesn't mean that she is out of the woods completely but it does mean that she is trending in the right direction and we are grateful for that and uh, hoping that that will continue uh, as the days go by. So continue to remember a lot of uh, those individuals. Also, you might notice on the white sheet today uh, that there is a Young at Heart group uh, that will be taking a trip to Old Time Bakery in Brooksville, Mississippi. And that is the end of this month uh, in April the 27th. There is a sign-up list on the table in the foyer that you can uh, sign if you'd like to go and be a part of this trip. Again, this is a Young at Heart trip to Old Time Bakery in Brooksville, Mississippi, and that will be April the 27th. And so if you'd like to be a part of that trip, then feel free to sign that list out on the table in the foyer. If you need more information, contact Roger or Deb, and I'm sure that they'll provide more info for you. But uh, the Young at Heart is starting to kind of get back into doing some things, going places and taking some trips, and so uh, we want to encourage everyone to be a part of that if you uh, uh, have interest there. Congregationally speaking, uh, continue to remember uh, all of those who are in leadership positions. I have mentioned to you in the past that during COVID, it's not easy to know how to lead a congregation from the standpoint of an eldership. And now as we are kind of re-engaging, there still needs to be a lot of wisdom on their part. And uh, they need our prayers and they need our support and encouragement as we kind of start back doing a lot of things. It's not an easy uh, task to figure out how we're going to do this, how we're going to do that, so forth and so on. And so uh, our elders have uh, done a really, really fine job over the last year in helping us navigate through this pandemic and through these things. And now as we're kind of coming out of that, uh, continue to be praying for them and thinking of them uh, as they are making decisions to start this back and start that back, so forth and so on. I know that they would very much appreciate your prayers in that regard. All right, uh, that's all I have to mention. Anything else we need to mention announcement-wise before we get started today? All right, well, again, thanks for being with us today. Let's begin our study this morning with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being called your children. We are so grateful, Father, for the opportunities like this that we have to open up your word, to spend time with other Christians, looking at what your word has to tell us so that, Father, we may live a life that is more devoted and consecrated in your sight. We're thankful, Father, for the topic that we will be talking about today, the concept of sanctification. Help us, Father, to do our best to understand this idea, to realize the importance of it in our life, and, Father, to exemplify this to others around us. We ask your blessings to continue to be with those who need our prayers. We thank you, Father, for the improvements that many have made in the last uh, few weeks. We ask that you'll continue to bless them, and may they continue to trend in a positive direction. And we pray, Father, that you will comfort those who have lost loved ones recently. Bless us as we study today. Forgive us for our sins. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. All right, I mentioned to you last week that as we move to uh, our study that is following that guideline of Brother Taylor's, 
mentioned that I did not know exactly where we would fall on justification and sanctification. It's all in one chapter in his study, and I have opted to forego the study of justification. The simple reason being, we have studied three times now ideas related to salvation uh, in three earlier lessons to that. And it's not that justification is not an important topic. It is, but we're replowing the same ground in many ways. And so I will encourage you to go to his uh, lesson number seven and go back and read some of the things that he says about justification. He actually spends less time in this chapter dealing with justification than he does the topic that we're going to deal with today. But I believe I can only bite off the idea of sanctification today. And so we'll move next week to lesson eight, Lord willing. All right, as we talk about the concept of sanctification, Maybe that you've heard this word, it may be that you've run across this word in the Bible, some form of it, and, and it may be that you have kind of uh, not really understood what sanctification is all about. Well, today our hope is that, that you're going to walk out of uh, this class saying, you know, I have a little bit better grasp of sanctification. And we need to start with just a, a general idea of trying to understand what this term means. This is kind of where we start in a lot of these basic Bible concepts, isn't it? We kind of really want to identify what we're talking about. We want to put a definition to a word. And so what is the idea of sanctification? I've put up this summary for us as we begin to try to understand what we're talking about today. In the Greek language, and we're specifically today talking primarily about sanctification from the viewpoint of the Christian age, our day and time, in the Greek language, to sanctify generally means to set apart something to make it different, if you will, from something else. In the biblical sense, the word means dedicated to God and set apart for a holy purpose. And so when you read of the term sanctification or sanctify, any form of that word in the New Testament, generally it has to do with setting aside for the purpose of God, making holy for the purpose of God, if you will. The antonym, and I find it helpful sometimes to uh, glean some understandings when you talk about what does it mean by way of opposites. If you talk about the opposite of sanctification, it is common. It is ordinary. So think about that. When we, we talk about sanctification, sanctification means it's not ordinary. It's not common. Okay, that's the antonym. Synonyms, if you will, for the idea of sanctification uh, will be consecration, uh, the idea of something being hallowed or holy, and then the idea of sacred. And this word, hagiazo, from the New Testament usage, this word is translated in a variety of ways in the New Testament scriptures. Um, in a place like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, listen to how Paul uses this term by expression. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those, listen to this, sanctified or set apart, devoted to God as holy. That's the meaning of sanctified there in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is oftentimes the way we see the term sanctified used in the New Testament. But you'll notice, as I mentioned a few moments ago, this word is translated in different ways other than sanctification in the New Testament. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, a form of the word there is translated holiness. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You strive for peace with everyone, the writer of Hebrews mentions here to these brethren, and you strive for setting yourself apart, you being different, if you will, being uncommon, distinctive, if you will, from the world. That's the idea of setting apart. In John chapter 17, verses 19, we'll spend a little time a little earlier than that in verse 17, a little later in our study, but look at the usage of the word that, that we find here in verse 19. 
for their sake, that is the sake of the apostles, Jesus says, I consecrate myself. The word consecrate there is the same word that is translated sanctified down here a little bit later. I concentrate myself. I consecrate myself. I set myself apart. I am not ordinary. I am set apart for the purpose of God that they may also be sanctified in truth. So Jesus here says, I set myself apart for the purpose of God so that they in turn can set themselves apart part for the purpose of God. I dedicate myself to doing the things God wants me to do so that they in turn can follow suit. And that word consecrate there has the same meaning as sanctified there. In Matthew chapter 23 verse 17, Jesus here talks about the sanctity, if you will, of the things in the temple. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? The word sacred here is the same word that's designated as sanctified. Now, when you go back to the imagery that's being referred to here among the children of Israel, the items in the temple... There were golden pieces of furniture and golden this, that, and the other. Was that gold the same gold as people might have gold in their pocket? You've got to be careful the way you answer that, right? In one sense, it's the same kind of gold, isn't it? Gold is gold is gold, right? But the gold in someone's pocket was different than the gold that was used to construct furniture items for the temple area because that gold and that article, whatever it is, that piece of furniture, whatever we're talking about there, it was consecrated. It was sanctified. It was set apart. It was different, if you will, than the gold someone would have in their pocket. And, and even if you had, if you were wealthy enough and you had pieces of furniture made of gold in your house as royalty in that day and time, that piece of furniture in your house would be different than that piece of furniture in God's house. Why? Because it was sanctified. It was consecrated. It was devoted for the purpose of God. And so you see this idea of sanctification uh, in the New Testament many times. In the model prayer that Jesus gave us uh, in Matthew chapter 6, in the beginning, pray like this, our Father in heaven, what's that word? Hallowed, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed here is the same word, sanctified, holy, okay, consecrated, set apart. God's name is different. It's a name, Right? God's name is a name just like we have a name, but God's name is different. It's set apart. It's holy. It's consecrated. It's not ordinary. It's not common. And so that's the idea. And so in the New Testament, you find this word, hagiatso, or a form of it, you find it mentioned in many different translations. But the idea, going back again to our definition, is that something is set apart. Something is devoted to God. That's the concept of sanctification. Now, it's very much apparent when we go back to the Old Testament that this is a, a, a continuing idea from the Old Testament. You see it mentioned so many times, especially in connection to the law of Moses. But even before the law of Moses, you're going to find this idea of sanctification. It's a different word than the Greek word, obviously. It's a Hebrew word. But uh, this is a word that means generally the very same thing. You see it mentioned in Genesis 2 in verse number 3. So God blessed the seventh day or the Sabbath day and made it what? Made it holy. That's the same word that we would use in the New Testament as sanctified. It's set apart. It's Saturday uh, under the law of, of Moses, under the Old Testament times. It's Saturday, another day of the week. Is it? Sure, it is. But was there something different about Saturday? Yes. And, and when you go to the law of Moses, God is going to command the children of Israel to observe Saturday as a day that is, we're going to say it like this, different. A day that is not common. A day that is not ordinary. A day that is set apart. What would the children of Israel do on, on that Saturday? They would rest. That was the, the 
off day, if you will, for the children of Israel that God legislated through the law of Moses. And so this idea of holy here in Genesis 2, verse 3, that's the same word that could be translated uh, sanctified. The Lord said to Moses in Exodus 13, consecrate to me or sanctify to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast is mine. God said when you have that firstborn child, that firstborn child is set apart for my purpose, devoted to me, different, if you will, in that way. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 8, we actually see it translated sanctify here, this word from the Old Testament, keep my statutes, do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you or allows you to be set apart, distinctive, different. And so going back to the, the Bible and asking the question, what does it mean when we use this term sanctified? It simply means that we are set apart. It means that something or someone is set apart for the purpose of God. It means that they are not ordinary. They're not common like everything else in, in society. Now, I want to kind of just stop right now and think about us as Christians being sanctified. Are you and I just like every other member of the human race? In that sense, yes. But in another sense, if we're Christians, we're not, are we? Because as Christians, we are to be set apart for the purpose of God. And so that's a trick question in many ways. When we say, are we just like everyone else in, in our world? In, in one sense, yes, we are. We're flesh and blood. We're unique. We're different from any other person on the face of this earth. That's the way God has created us. But on the other hand, we're different. We're not ordinary. We're not common. We've been set apart for the purpose of God. That's the idea of sanctification. Now, when we start looking in the Bible for examples, I don't believe that I can probably get any better and more concise with what Brother Taylor mentions in his book. If you've got your book, uh, page number 23 is where I will be reading from, down in the, the latter part of this page under letter C. When, when we talk about examples, um, number one, under letter C, he mentions Ezra set apart 12 men in Babylon who were referred to as holy or sanctified or consecrated to carry the vessels and gifts to Jerusalem. And so there's 12 men. They're just like the other Israelites there, but there's been 12 who have been selected, and they have been set apart for this special this special trip to Jerusalem and, and carrying these things. Going down to number two, some biblical examples of some things that were set apart or deemed as holy. Mount Sinai, uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 23 is an example. The tabernacle and all its vessels and furnishings, Exodus 40, verses 9 and 10, among others. One's house, one's field, fast, the Sabbath, all of those were things, if you will, that were set apart to be devoted to God, to be used in the service of God. That's the things. What about animals? Under the law of Moses, let it be, all the animals used as sacrifices were sanctified before they were used as offerings. Now, we've mentioned in the last several weeks the fact that Old Testament uh, usage of sin and, and redemption, all of those things, there was the usage, if you will, the sacrifice of animals. Okay? Some of those animals might be, say, a lamb. Anything different from a lamb that you would see on the way to Jerusalem, maybe in your travels, anything different from that lamb that might be offered on your behalf at Jerusalem? In one sense, no, it's just a lamb. It's an animal, right? Not any difference between that animal and an, and an animal you might see, possibly. However, the animal offered was consecrated to God, sanctified, right? Also had to have some criteria to be met, but it's not just an animal in that sense. It's, it has special significance. It's not ordinary. It's not common. And so animals that were used for sacrifices were sanctified. People were sanctified. We touched on this a moment ago. The firstborn of males, Exodus 13, 12, all of Israel, the Levites from the other tribes. Now, I'll stop right there and I'll kind of uh, elaborate on this one. Anything different from the Levites and say the Benjaminites, uh, those who were from the tribe of 
say Judah, any different between difference between them and the Levites? Any difference? Well, in some ways, no. <laughs> they were all collectively descendants from who? Who's the patriarch? Abraham. Okay. Everyone is a descendant from Abraham, and so they could they could trace their lineage back there. They could trace even their lineage back to Jacob, right? And so they had some things in common, but tell me what the difference was when it comes to the Levites among the children of Israel. Okay, they were priests. That was the tribe that the priests came from. All the religious services and activities and things of that nature, guess who did those? They were the Levites. Okay, And God had ordained that to be the case. Out of all the tribes of Israel, God said, I'm going to choose the Levites to be, if you will, consecrated, to be different, to be distinct compared to the others in the tribes of Israel. And so we would find that, that going back to the law of Moses and that system that was enacted there, that the Levites would be set aside for the purpose of God, if you will, consecrated, set apart in a different way than everyone else. Jeremiah was consecrated or sanctified even before he was born, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. So we see examples. Many of them are found in the Old Testament that help teach us about the idea of sanctification. So probably we have a pretty good idea by now of what it means to be sanctified. Questions, comments before we go further? All right, well, let's get to the nitty-gritty. If we understand what sanctification is, and we can see sanctification in the Bible by way of example, we're going to ask the question, how is a person sanctified today? And maybe we have some confusion on this. How, how are we sanctified today? That's not an easy question to answer in some ways. In other ways, it might be a little simpler. But in some ways, this is a difficult question because we have to understand exactly what sanctification is and, and where it comes from. So let's kind of delve into this question. I want us to start answering this question from John 17 and verse number 17. Now this is the prayer of Jesus, the real prayer of Jesus, not the model prayer that Jesus gave, but the prayer that Jesus actually prayed to his Father in the presence of his apostles on the night of his betrayal. Now, this is not the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he is there alone and there are a few of his disciples close by. That's not that prayer. This is a prayer where Jesus has all of his apostles around him, all of his disciples with him, except by this time for one. And who is that one? Right, by this time in the evening, Judas is no longer part of, of this group. Judas has already left this group at this point. So there's 11 disciples that Jesus is going to pray this prayer. And this is a personal prayer, if you will, of Jesus to the Father. Now, the apostles, the disciples are here, but he is praying this in their midst. So this is what many call the real Lord's Prayer. This is the real prayer that Jesus prayed on his behalf, pouring his heart out to the Father in regards to the disciples here. Now, in this prayer, he's talking in verse 17 about the disciples. Now, he's going to talk about all uh, future believers later on. But he says this about the disciples. Sanctify them in the truth, or by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, there's some things that we can understand about sanctification here. And, and I'm going to use Brother Wayne Jackson uh, as someone to help explain where I'm going here on this point. And I've told you before on the Christian Courier website, Brother Wayne Jackson, also his son who uh, has uh, helped with that website and with that writing over the years, they have a gift, and the gift is to take something very complex and make it very simple to understand. That's a gift that some people have to, to simplify down something that, that can be very difficult to understand. Look at what Brother Wayne Jackson says here. He says, there is an ultimate sense in which only God sanctifies a person. 
On behalf of his disciples, Jesus addressed his Father, sanctify them. The verb is an imperative form suggesting a strong petition. And the sanctification of this text is not salvation. The disciples were saved already. This request was that they be set apart and fortified for the rigorous work that would be required of them after their master's departure. Now, this is a, this is a mouthful that he says here. This is a mouthful, and it deserves kind of us breaking this down. First and foremost, looking back to John 17, 17, Brother Jackson says, and I agree 100%, there is a sense in which ultimate sanctification is provided for by God. Now, in this text, he says, Jesus petitions the Father, sanctify them. Are they sanctifying themselves? What's, it, what, what's Jesus asking here? He's asking the Father to sanctify them. Father, you set them apart, right? That's what we see in the construction of the words in this uh, verse. Father, you sanctify them. And you know, that agrees with New Testament Scripture. Look at who it is that sanctifies. <clears throat> and there's a number of these passages in the New Testament. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sanctifies people according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Who is the one who sanctifies? All right, God. This is a reference more than likely to God the Father, right? But that's not all we see in the New Testament Scripture. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse 2 and then ask, who sanctifies so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Who's doing the sanctifying here? In 1 Thessalonians 5, who's doing the sanctifying? It's God the Father. Who's doing the sanctifying here in Hebrews 13? Jesus. Okay. I'm not going to be surprised then what we're going to see in Romans 15, are you? But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by who? By the Holy Spirit. Um, have you been watching where we've gone? In one verse it says we're sanctified by God, the Father. Another verse we're sanctified by who? Jesus. Another verse it says we're sanctified by who? The Holy Spirit. So what do you understand here? We're sanctified by deity, by the Godhead. And that's what Brother Jackson is saying when he mentions in this statement here, there is a sense in which only God, the Godhead, is able to sanctify. It, it is only the Godhead who is able to make us truly apart and set apart, devoted to to his service. And so that's one thing we need to understand, that the sanctification process, when we ask, how are we sanctified? Well, ultimately, in one sense, we answer that by saying, well, we're sanctified by God. But let's notice something else that is mentioned in Brother Jackson's comments here about John 17, 17. And that is, there is a difference between the cleansing of someone from sin and the sanctification. Catch that now. Brother Jackson here says, the sanctification of this text is not salvation. Why do we know that? Because at this point in time, are the disciples saved or are they lost? They're saved. So when Jesus says to the Father, Father, I want you to sanctify them. I want you to sanctify them. He's not talking about sanctifying the unsaved, is he? He's talking about sanctifying the saved. And so that makes us ask the question, is there a difference between salvation and sanctification? Guess what the answer is? Yes, there's a difference there. Show me the difference, Gary. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 11. You might remember that the preceding two verses, there's a number of sins that are mentioned. 
This is how Paul kind of ends that discussion. And such were some of you. In other words, you used to be in that, that group of people that I've talked about. You used to be among those people that practiced these things. You lived these wicked lifestyles. Something happened. Listen to how it's described here. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see what he's mentioning there? You were washed. When are we cleansed? When we're washed. That's an illusion of baptism, isn't it? When we're washed, we're cleansed. But notice, we're washed and we're sanctified, right? We're justified. Now, you also see this over in Ephesians chapter 5 here, as husbands are exhorted to follow the example of Jesus. Look at what we can learn about sanctification here. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might what? Sanctify her, that he might set her apart, if you will, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So when does sanctification happen? Before or after the cleansing? Well, it's after the cleansing in these two passages. You were washed, you were sanctified, you've been cleansed, and now you can be sanctified. And so we see here something Brother Jackson mentions that's important for us to notice. And there is a distinction between the cleansing of Jesus' blood in our lives, taking care of our sin. There's a difference between that and being sanctified, being set apart. Now, Brother Jackson will say that it is important to realize that you cannot have sanctification without salvation. Those two things are absolutely codependent. In fact, the basis of our sanctification, if you, if you understand the Scriptures, the basis of our sanctification is the same basis as our salvation, isn't it? The blood of Jesus Christ is what has made possible our salvation and our sanctification. In fact, he will mention it like this a little later. Christ's death was necessary for both the cleansing and sanctification process. The cleansing is accomplished by the washing of water with or by the word, but the cleansing is preparatory to sanctification. So Brother Jackson mentions when we're talking about salvation, that's one thing. When we're talking about sanctification, that's another thing. It's kind of looking at the same kind of thing from two angles in some way or another, if you will. And so we see, number one, God is the means of our sanctification. Sanctification comes when we are cleansed. But what is the process by which this takes place? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, I believe, helps us to understand how we are sanctified and the process by which we are sanctified. We're not just sanctified when we're baptized into Christ. We need to understand that. There are people who have been saved who are not sanctified. You'll see what I'm saying about that as I develop this idea beginning in 1 Peter 3. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, Peter writes, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, that is your opponents, nor be troubled, but in your hearts. Some of you read from a version that says what here? Sanctify. Honor is the way it's rendered here. It's the same word, hagiatso. Same word we've been talking about all morning in regards to sanctification. But in your hearts, sanctify or honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. People are going to ask you about Jesus Christ. How does the sanctification process work here? Where does it start? Right here. You have to make a determination that you're going to be used in that set-apart way. You have to make a determination as a Christian that you're going to be allowed to be used for God for His purpose. You have to make a choice mentally that says, I'm going to do the will of God instead of my own will. Sanctification, and Brother Wayne Jackson brings this out in his article on what is sanctification in the Christian career. He says sanctification, in a, in, a, in a very real sense for us as Christians, it begins in our mind. We have to make that choice. Now, some of us make that choice as we're obeying the gospel. 
For some of us, as we make that choice to obey the gospel, we say, not only am I giving my life to Jesus today, but I'm giving my life to him for what? For all time. That's the idea of sanctification. There are other people who are baptized into Christ who realize after the fact, you know, I've, that's, that's supposed to be my life. It's interesting when you start asking the question in scriptures, when are we talking about salvation and when are we talking about sanctification? Look at Luke 9, 23. This is a familiar passage to us, isn't it? Jesus said here, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Is this a passage about salvation or more about sanctification? It's more about sanctification, isn't it? How do we know that? Because this is a daily thing, right? If anyone wants to come after me, Jesus said, you've got to deny yourself and you've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow me. And how often does this take place? Every day. And so when we talk about the, the sanctification process, it is an everyday renewal, isn't it? It's an everyday thing. As I am baptized into Christ and I'm cleansed of my sin, I began that day to live for Jesus Christ. But there is a sense in which my sanctification continues on every day from then on. When we got up this morning, we made a decision, consciously or unconsciously, today I'm going to live for me. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. That's sanctification. That's a sanctification choice right there. And Jesus says we have to make that decision every day of our life. Now, how does that happen? How do we know how to be set apart, if you will? Well, we'll go back to our passage in John 17. Sanctification ultimately comes from God. The basis is Jesus' blood is connected to our cleansing. But how are we set apart? We're set apart by our obedience to what? To the Word of God. Sanctify them by your truth or in your truth. Your Word is truth. What makes us as Christians different? What makes us, if you will, not ordinary compared to everyone else in the world? What makes us not common with everyone else in the world? Isn't it our willingness to open up this book to read it, understand it, and apply the things therein to our life? Isn't that what makes us different? Isn't that what sets us apart? Yes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in what? In the truth. In the truth, there's the, the truth of God's Word. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in this light, but consider the Great Commission and consider the, the part that is salvation, if you will, and then the part that's consecration or devotion to God, one being sanctified. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. Where do we see the sanctification here? Probably more than anywhere else. It's not necessarily in the making of disciples, although that ought to be something mentioned, and that's very helpful to, to say, isn't it, Brother Greg? Very helpful before anyone's baptized into Christ, that they understand this isn't just about today. This is about future days. This is about not just making Jesus the, the Savior of your life, but the Lord of your life as well. The true sanctification process really comes when we start reading and studying and learning the will of God and we start applying that to our lives and we start to transform, if you will. By the way, speaking of that, go to Romans chapter 12 and listen to that language. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, some versions say worship, I believe the right translation here is service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your what? Do you see the mind there? 1 Peter 3, we're, we're, we're sanctified because we have set our mind to be that way. It, it is a decision of our heart, a decision of our mind that's going to show up in our actions. Now, what influences our way of thinking? What influences our mind? It better be the Word of God. 
better not be someone else's word, better not be someone else's opinion. It better be the word of God. God wants us set apart for his purpose. Where do we find his purpose? We find it in his word. And so, in many ways, this is what I talk about from Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. And it's a, it's a verse I don't believe. It's a concept that I don't believe many people in the religious world give it. It's, it's real deep. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in talking about Jesus, this is the conclusion of his message. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, some versions say, that this Jesus has been made both what? Lord and, and Christ. Now, Christ has to do with the cleansing. That, that word has to do with the Savior aspect. But the word Lord has to do with the sanctification. There are a lot of people who want to say, well, I want to be saved. I want my sins forgiven. But don't tell me I need to live a certain way from then on. I can live as I want because God's going to save me through the blood of Jesus Christ no matter how I want to live my life from here on. Folks, that's foreign to the Scriptures. It is a package deal. I don't know if you ever have made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and mashed those two pieces of bread together around those two components there, but there's a sense that once you get those things combined, you really can't separate them, can you? I mean, they've kind of been put together and slammed together and such. You can't get the jelly from the peanut butter. You can't extract the peanut butter from the... I mean, it, it's all... It's kind of a package deal at that point, right? Well, that's Jesus being not just our Savior, but being our Lord. It's a package deal. You can't... It's not, it's not a buffet where you go and you get one or the other, whichever one you like. It's not that way. Spiritually speaking, we have to choose both, or we have neither. We have neither. We have to have salvation and sanctification. We can't have one to the exclusion of the other. And so when we ask the question, how is a person sanctified? Ultimately, it comes from God. God provides that means. The basis is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a little different than the idea of being cleansed. It's very closely related, however. But we're sanctified when every single day of our life, we say, I'm going to be devoted for the purpose of God. It's a daily decision that we make, day in and day out. How do we know how we're supposed to be living to fulfill the purpose of God? The Word of God guides us. We rely on God's Word to transform our life, to make us be what He wants us to be. That's how we're sanctified. Last question I've got, and last will be yours this morning, or the last idea. Why is sanctification so important? Well, I've already started talking about it in a sense, but you, you see it mentioned verbatim. Going back to a passage we, we cited earlier in Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness. You could translate that sanctification. For the sanctification. For the consecration. For the being set apart for the, for the, pur pur for the purpose of God. And for the holiness without which no one, what? Will see the Lord. That's not saying you're not going to see the Lord when he comes. <laughs> It's not saying you're not going to see the Lord on the day of judgment. What does it mean here when it says you won't see the Lord? It means you're going to be lost. Question. Can we be saved eternally without being sanctified? You get that. You see that here very clearly, don't you? You strive to be this kind of person because if you don't, you will not see Christ. You will be lost. So go back again to that Acts 2, 30, 36 idea. We want to live our life to only have the blood of Christ cleanse us from our sins, but we want to have nothing to do with sanctification. Folks, we will have a rude surprise on the day of judgment. That's why sanctification is so, so important, so that God can be working in our lives today. Jesus would say it like this. And this word that he uses, Lord, is very important. Lord means master. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Verbally, you call me your master, but you're not showing me that, you're, that I'm your master in the way you live. 
There's a lot of people who are Christians today who fall into this category. I'm not saying we're never going to be perfect. That's not part of the sanctification process. It's God who completely sanctifies us through the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's a difference between the person who sins while trying to live for Jesus Christ every day and the person who says, you know what, I'm living for myself. There's a difference between those two people. God is pleased with the person who has decided to live for him for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when all Christians have been cleansed, when we all are sanctified, then the purpose of God can be worked in this world through our hands. God can use us. The Christian that says, I'm not going to be sanctified, God can't use us. God can't use us for anything positive and good for those people around us. Really great. And in both cases, if you're not hearing on the microphones at home, Brother Greg mentions the fact that salvation and sanctification is an ongoing process. At any time, as a Christian, I can say, I'm going to stop. Um, and, and by the way I live my life, the blood of Jesus can mean nothing to my life any longer. I can be saved today but not be saved tomorrow. I can be sanctified today and not be sanctified tomorrow. It all depends on what, what we've determined in our mind that we're going to do. And then the willingness or unwillingness to follow the will of God. Very good observation. What other comments, questions as we bring our class to the close? All right, next week, Lord willing, we're going to move to uh, lesson eight. We're going to be talking about the idea of faith. The idea of faith. And I uh, hope that it will be a beneficial study. I hope this one today has been helpful to you. And I hope that next time that you read that word sanctified or sanctification, I hope that it means a little bit more to you maybe than, than when we first came into class today. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed today. Our Father God in heaven, we again thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we've had to study from your word. We're grateful, Father, for those who have an interest in learning what your word has to say. And those who have an interest, Father, not only in knowing those things, but a willingness, Father, to do those things in their life. And Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we've had today to learn about this basic concept of sanctification. Help us to understand it to the very fullest that we can. And help us, Father, to every day realize that we make a decision, conscious or unconscious, who it is that we will live for in this life and help us, Father, to always make the choice to live for you. We pray, Father, that you will bless us along that path. We know, Father, that we struggle, that we have many failings and we're frail and we stumble so many times. And we pray, Father, that you will richly continue to forgive us for those things. And help us always to continue, Father, to be willing to turn to your way of life and allow your word to mold our life so that, Father, we may be fully sanctified in you. Father, bless your work throughout the world, not only here at Northport, but in other places. May each and every child of yours understand the importance of sanctification and live lives that reflect that in their life. Father, when we do that, we know that your purposes will be able to be accomplished more fully, that, Father, your work can continue through our lives in an undisturbed way. And we pray, Father, that you would help us all to realize how important this idea, this concept of sanctification is to accomplishing your will today. Bless us as we leave. Continue to watch over us. Bless us as we continue this study next week by looking at the concept of faith.